this is Rob Dienhorn, and Rob's going to be talking about domain-driven design. Right? Yes, this will probably end up being like a part one or intro two, rather than a whole thing, because there's a lot to digest, especially if you haven't thought about what it means to have a large business that's using a similarly large Rails application to manage their stuff. So, <coughs> let's see what I can close up here. Probably all of that. Okay, so the um, this is all off the cuff, which is why it's not being broadcast live. And if you have questions, please interrupt me because that'll kind of make it seem like I'm just I'm answering your questions and not just stumbling through whatever I can remember. <coughs> Alan, so domain driven design. This book came out in 2003, which is pre Rails. All, not quite pre-Ruby landing in this continent. Um, it is a way of looking at designing f an application first for the domain that it is an, a solution for. Instead of looking at the language or looking at the framework, you're looking at the domain, the problem domain that you're trying to solve. It looks, it it tells you you should have a ubiquitous language. You should be using the same terms, the same language with your business people as you are with your technical people so that you're not having to translate and use terms that don't make sense in one or the other. Is this like metaphor and XP? This would be very much, it would be like metaphor and XP, except it's really talking about the terms that you use. If you so, for example, for Scrum Alliance, the, the client that is, is for whom I'm undertaking this and have been for a while, um, they refer to the Scrum Alliance members as members. So that's what the rewrite that we're working on is calling this entity a member, not a user, not a you know, person, not a login, not an account. They're a member. Um, so that, that's one small aspect. We've, we've sort of renamed a couple of the things as we've gone along because the name that is used when discussing things with the business is not the name that currently exists in the application or in the database. Um, and so we're, we're trying to align those as well. <coughs> um, part of what domain-driven design encourages you to do in identifying entities, which are the, the business valued objects that the system is going to deal with. So you have entities. Um, those would be what would typically in a Rails application be implemented with a model. You also have uh, services, which would typically go somewhere either in a model or in a controller, maybe, depending on what you were doing. But this is where it starts to become a little muddier when you think about what I want to do in the context of the framework and not in context of the application and what you want to do from a solution perspective. Uh, we mentioned earlier, oh, you almost basically described what you want to do using a user story. One of the things that when we started looking into this that came out is, oh, well, Rails has these you know, models go in this directory, and controllers go in this directory, and views go here. One of the nice things that Rails brings is the convention of where to go to find things. One of the problems that we've run into with a lar long-lived application that has a uh, change frequency that is mismatched with Rails's own change frequency, um, in some ways faster and in some ways much slower. Um, there's a bit of a mismatch there when you're trying to figure out, well, where, where do I put this? So one of the things that we've done is say, well, that a user story ends up being implemented 
represented in our, our design as a service. So if you are looking for where would the code be that uh, loads students onto a course, well, if you were looking strictly at a Rails app or thinking of it just with your Rails hat on, you'd be like, well, am I looking at like a, a courses controller or is it like a, a student's controller or something like that? Well, in the way we've got things laid out, you'd go to the services subdirectory, uh, app services, and then you're dealing with courses. So, oh, there's a courses subdirectory there, which is basically namespacing these things. And you'd find, oh, look, there's a service under courses called load students. Oh, and it deals with courses and it deals with trainers and things like that. Um, as mentioned earlier, things about permissions. Um, and that's been, that's gone through a whole lot of things with Scrum Alliance, but we're currently using, and as far as we can tell, we're going to continue to use Pundit um, to do that. It lets us organize the entity based authorizations, the permissions of the, what people can do, very succinctly. Um, the only thing that we've recently run into is a problem that was a little bit more easily solved with CanCan -Can when you had one big ability class that just had everything in there at once. Because Pundit tends to be, you set up a policy class that typically deals with a single object. And when you have a um, an, a, an actor, subject, action kind of thing. So the current user who's trying to do this, that's your, your actor, who's the, what's the subject, what entity are you trying to do something with, and then what is the thing that you're trying to do. So we have that kind of issue, but we also have, oh, things like, well, I, can you take this organization and can you create this new team? Well, wait, there's that fourth thing in there. You've got another entity. Can you do that? Um, so we, we're kind of stretching a little bit beyond what we think in terms of the pundit class. But now, if you look at our application directory, instead of just seeing Rails as your models, controllers, views, you would also see services and uh, policies and repos, which I'm going to spend a little more time on. One of the things that comes out of the domain driven design is that you don't directly deal with the storage for an application. Your business doesn't care where or how something is stored. Your solution doesn't really care. What it cares about is what the repository pattern gives you. And there's a lot that sort of draws on, and actually Martin Fowler wrote the foreword to this book, um, some of the enterprise application patterns. And a repo is very simply, I can give an entity to a repo and tell it to save it. And it will tell me, OK, here's the identity for that thing. I can give a repo an identity later and get back my original entity. And I can give a repo some criteria to go and find all of the entities that it knows about that match that criteria. One of the problems that the ease of doing things with Rails brings, and Active Record in particular, is that Active Record, even though there's a pattern called Active Record, the Active Record gem that comes with Rails is really like four different patterns. It is the Active Record pattern, but it's also the repository pattern, and it's also the criteria pattern, and it's also, I can't remember what the other one, there's like a relationship pattern or something like that, the association that lets you have, you know, order has many lines kind of thing. There's, there's another whole pattern there. So when you, when you cram all these things together, if you stay on the straight and narrow and do things the way Rails suggests that you do things, things become very easy. And a lot of the very simple, certainly a lot of the very initial applications that you end up putting together, when they're early, they're still kind of simple. They haven't had time to grow complexity and get tangled and have special cases thrown into the mix. It's very fast to just do things the Rails way and, and get away with it very easily. But Rails lets you, you know, just lay these 
lines of doing things all over the place so that you are tripping all over them later. Not only in terms of, oh, how do I fit this in, but where do I put this? Um, why is this, this class, you know, a thousand lines long now? Um, where, would I, where would I put this code except in this model class? And uh, a lot of that becomes a little bit easier to answer when we're trying to organize the code with this domain-driven design philosophy in mind. One of, the, one of the great examples that we ran into uh, several weeks ago was we used to have in our organization model, an organiza if you've used GitHub, organizations are very much like GitHub. You've got an organization, you've got teams, you have members on teams, and depending on what team you're on, you have different permissions to do stuff. In the training world, you've got organizations and you've got like an owner's team, a trainer's team, delegates that can do stuff, that could schedule courses, that could you know, upload your students for you. You wouldn't have to do it yourself. When we create an organization, the model used to have an after create hook that would create the two teams, the owner's team and the trainer's team that we always expect an organization to have. And there's certain, you, you can't change those, they have to exist. And you can't change what permissions the members of those teams have. If you want them to, you can give other teams similar permissions, but you can't change those two. Well, as an after commit hook in the organization model class, it had to know a lot about teams in order to have this hook work. In the service that set, the organization service that creates an organization, the service now deals with the organization entity, and after it creates that entity, it also goes and creates some teams. So services have a little bit wider view of what the application is doing. Entities don't really know much about other entities. They sort of know about themselves. So any code that really wants to deal with anything sort of transactional, multi-entities cooperating, or um, you, know, you need multiple entities in order to make decisions, a lot of times that code is going to go into a service and if you and, and it's a much more direct mapping from a user story to a service this is what I want something to do this is where I'm going to do it we've had to thought think a lot about uh, how the naming conventions need to work um, <coughs> let me actually go to Yeah, we'll wake it up. The Apple TV or the whole presentation thing? I think it's the Apple TV because the projector is not sitting there. There we go. Bottom, bottom, please. This is not what I want you to see. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, though. Um, uh, <coughs> How's that? Look at that. See, I didn't have to bump it. It was all ready to go. Um, so we, we run into a number of little um, tweaks that, so this is, you know, things that we've run into that we have to stop and think, well, okay, this isn't exactly, you know, clean cut. We're trying to, we, there, I mean, it's still eventually going to be a Rails application, but what we're trying to do is have a nice boundary between what is framework and what is application? So that when Rails changes versions and syntax on things change or whatever, um, that can change independently of this nice interface that we have between our application code, which is dealing with entities and has a repo pattern of its own. Um, sometimes it gets a little more wordy, but knowing the kind of problems that we've run into and the reason that we're looking at this in the first place um, so far, we're still willing to uh, write a little bit more. Uh, where's the summary? <coughs> yeah, so we've ended up having to come up with some sort of our own guidelines on, okay, where would you look for this stuff? What would be the convention for where you would find it? Um, and hopefully this... I mean, this is probably not all the things that we've thought about, but we've tried to capture a lot of them at least. Um, we realize that our services, yeah. 
Okay, I have a great slide that will help explain this and it might scare people if they've been doing Ruby and Rails for a long time. Um, nope. <coughs> um, <laughs> is this light enough? So um, this was part of something that was presented to the Scrum Alliance Board of Directors a while back. And I'm going to actually have to f bump the font down because it's a lot of information. But these are years and quarters. Um, and these are Rails versions and Ruby versions. And if we make it so you can actually see stuff on the screen, um, to give you an idea of this impedance mismatch that I mentioned about the rate of change of things. Um, so the different colors across the top are different development organizations that had been involved in writing the Scrum Alliance site, which began actually prior to 2007 by at least a bit, but that's as early as we have uh, archaeological evidence in the repository. <coughs> so the Scrum Alliance was tracking pretty well until this this is a very light gray because this year of development they basically th this the group that did this was so bad that they basically threw this code out and went back and started over from here so there's essentially a jump nothing basically happened from this point to this point uh, and there was another group that was involved for three months one of the things that they did um, and I had an another graph at one point a couple years ago uh, they threw away all the tests. And it's really clear when you looked at the, uh, the co rate of code change, when they threw away the tests, the rate of code change went up. But we, five to six months <laughs> later, we were still finding stuff that's like, ah, oh, this doesn't work. And like, this code was changed like, you know, four months ago. How can it not have been a problem? Well, th their contract ended at the end of December, at the end of 2010. And as far as I can tell, there was code from at least as early as October that may not have ever actually have been in production until they shoved everything that they had into production at the end of their contract. Mm -hmm. And then as people realized there's something screwy happening, February, March, when things rolled around and people realized things were kind of goofy. Um, and there were a couple of uh, think business things that Scrum Alliance changed in this nine or 12 month period um, that didn't have the best implementation and some of which have been completely rewri rewritten since. Um, and of course, bad code doesn't help at all. But these are all of the Rails versions and approximately when they ca came out. Um, the version that Scrum Alliance sort of got stuck on was uh, back in 2.3. And one of the things that makes it hard to try to do an upgrade of the system is that uh, 2.3 and I, there's no way to font bump the tooltip. Um, so this is the first one that offered some Ruby 1.9 um, compatibility. But then when you start looking at 3.0, um, oh, it still works with Ruby 1.8.7. I don't remember what 3.1 did, but that was a release I think we could we managed to, to, to be able to say that we could skip. Um, you 3.2 is not going to support 187 and 40 only supports 19 or better and uh, the other note is that rails 5 is going to require ruby 2 so and and if you look it's almost impossible to try to predict exactly when rails 5 might happen uh, because rails versioning is pretty much at the whim of the rails core team or dhh in particular or who knows what I, they may just they may have chicken bones uh, to figure out when to have new releases. Um, along with that is the landscape for Ruby itself. And 
the various versions that happened and when they were uh, bug fixes only and hit end of life. And this is needs to be updated because 187 has gotten at least two, maybe three reprieves from other companies like Heroku and somebody else that have picked up the support ball for 187 and backported some of the fixes. Um, some of these changes, there was a nice, if anyone was working in Rails in the first part of 2013, security vulnerabilities and their patches suck because all of these releases were all because of security vulnerabilities that came out. So, uh, well, they he he. There's more. There's more than I mean, a lot of his bugs were the security <laughs> vulnerabilities. Then, um, so these were like so. Here we got this one deployed same day. They got this one deployed in the day. This one was same day. This one was same day. Um, but there was a time. I recall some of those rail versions came out in the same day as the previous one, right? Like something came out and didn't work, and then they re-released. Um, yeah, there's some of those in here somewhere. Um, but it was at this time when they were releasing these things and they had their important security fixes that um, they clarified, you know what, <laughs> this is how we're going to do our Rails versioning policy from now on because clearly people were a little crazy trying to backport things through four different versions that were available at the time. Um, so as, so as soon as, the, as Rails 4 uh, dropped, um, they basically said, here, we're going to just do security fixes one version back. Regular bug fixes are going to be applied to our current branch, and security fixes one minor release back, that's it. And they've, they've very generously gone and done a little bit above and beyond that for a couple of problems. But when you go and look at some of the details of some of the vulnerable, and some of these are like not just one security fix. These are like, uh, um, some of these are three or four that were all in the same update. Um, and there's more than this that have happened. Some of these later ones in um, three whatever um, are also security vulnerabilities, but luckily either what you had to do to expose that vulnerability was something that wasn't included in the code. Sometimes they were kind of semi-stupid things that you should have probably been slapped on the wrist for doing anyway, and it just so happened that, oh, the reason that you should have been slapped on the wrist is because, oh, Rails didn't sanitize that input, and you stupidly let it pass on through to some other call. Um, there have been a number of other things that theoretically affected the 2.3 Rails branch. Um, that didn't affect Scrum Alliance's application, um, but uh, if you have if you have any problems backporting a gem or a patch from <coughs> a later Ruby or a later Rails to run on one eight seven or run on Rails two three, and you have any questions, send them my way because I can probably tell you I've run into the the same issue at one point or other. So the app the app is currently on 2.3.18. Um, 2.3.18, I don't think there's been anything I've, there, nothing's come up that I've actually had to backport uh, from a security perspective um, that was announced as affecting 2.3. And any, any security thing that came out that affected something earlier, they described, here's, if your code looks like this, you're in trouble, you know, change this stuff to this. You know, search for that, and hopefully none of those have happened. But because of this uh, impedance mismatch between how fast, in some cases, how dreadfully fast, um, this is this is actually a period of only about six weeks when all these r releases came out for Rails. Um, and as you noticed yesterday or Sunday, there was another Rails. Uh, release where they release patches for another security vulnerability. Um, so having things change out from under you in a way that means you better react now, um, it's not nearly as widespread as Heartbleed was 
a few months back. Uh, but if you were friends with anyone who was DevOps or had to deal with that, you realize the urgency sometimes with some of these security vulnerabilities. Um, so that's the big, um, that's the biggest reason to try to do this rewrite. The other reason that uh, we sold rewrite versus um, just trying to do the upgrades, and and I've mapped this out and re answered some people on like Rails lists. Um, in order to get from a Ruby 187 and a Rails 2318 up to current, up to a Ruby 2.1 and a Rails 4.1, you have to take at least six individual upgrade steps. Either upgrading Rails or upgrading Ruby because you can upgrade Rails so far, but then it needs the new hash syntax, so you have to upgrade Rails to at least 1.9, and you can't do 2 yet because it's not guaranteed to support 2. It would be six different upgrades, some of which are um, normally nasty and in some particular ways even more nasty for an old application uh, that's been around since the Rails 1.2 days. Uh, or actually, I think actually it's the site originally dates from Rails 1.0 days. Um, and there are several parts of it that really show that age. Um, this top thing is basically the um, relationship between all the model, most, most of the models, this isn't even all of them, in the Rails application that Scrum Alliance has. Um, you can see user here is quite central. Uh, pretty much, um, if you tried to ear load everything from user, you'd be basically pulling the entire database in almost every time. Um, it gets a little bit simpler when you look at the bottom and say, okay, don't show me all the connections to user. I'll just kind of assume that user's probably in there somewhere. Um, so you get these little islands of functionality that are sort of, you know, interrelated in very tightly coupled kind of ways. Um, but when you start thinking, oh, about 15 months ago, Scrum Alliance took a lot of the more sort of pedestrian aspects of what the site did and moved it to an actual content management system platform. So the things in here that did, um, yeah, let me make this part bigger so I can point to stuff better. So the things that did like, oh, blog posts, well, let's CMS has a piece for that. Um, the whole thing about FAQs and any other kind of just random page, well, the CMS does. That's what CMSs do. That's fine. Um, user groups and events, those are mostly in the CMS. Um, articles and being able to tag articles, that's all in the CMS. So there's a whole bunch of, and this is doing the tests for taking your Scrum Master test on the site itself, well, that hasn't happened for a couple years now, so that can all get thrown away. Um, we still do this remote exam stuff, so that has to stay. Uh, maps were for searching, that's part of the CMS. So there's all these pieces that are basically have just been, you know, cut off at the knees. We, you'd never access those on the Rails app anymore. So there's a bunch of stuff that just isn't needed. So not only do you not need to port this stuff, whoops. Um, you only need to port sort of this. And notice that member is here, but this is also member because otherwise it gets really confusing. And this is also certification, which is also up here. The stuff that's in black is the stuff that we've already done. Um, we started with a very small core to try to make sure that we understood how we wanted stuff to fit into the domain-driven design style of architecting the application first and tying it to the framework sort of second. Um, so we've tried very much to do this in a sort of a sane way. Um, and it really makes you realize, oh, there's, there's some order dependency when you, you know what everything's supposed to be and how it eventually is going to hook together, but you have to sort of build it out in a at least um, reasonable way. And that's sort of what we had here. And we actually had to do a little rework 
You know, so members, well, that's pretty much the central thing. The, the Rails side of the Scrum Alliance application is basically dealing with um, four concepts that are not in the, or not, the core of them is not in the CMS system. Um, membership, courses, certifications, and anything that has to do with making payments. So your renewal payments, trainers paying for the students they've uploaded to courses. So those, those four core things are sort of embodied in the Rails app and various some peripheral things that go along with that, like supporting the ability to hit the third party service that hosts the tests when you take your Scrum Master, um, some external things like that. Um, so we end up building this out in and you've seen this ugliness so I'm just going to make those go away so we end up saying okay well you can you can sort of build member it doesn't the, as an entity member doesn't really know about other stuff it has association to other things the other things know about it it's the typical in the active record world uh, has many versus it belongs to do I have the reference to that other thing? Do I belong to it, or does it find, or do I find it because it has a reference to me, and I have many of those? Um, so we went through and said, okay, well, what? How would you build these things out? Well, start with member. That's pretty clear. Uh, get back over there. Um, then initially, course, we only had this little internal piece here. So courses. That's that's pretty significant, and we can't have trainers until we can't assign trainers to courses until we have members and courses. That's kind of a no-brainer. Um, one of the things that we are pulling out of the way the Scrum Alliance currently works is this idea of attendance, because they're introducing more things that aren't directly certification related. You can go to courses and do things that are not necessarily going to be part of a certification. So tying members to courses through this certification model really sort of goes against the grain for that ubiquitous language that I mentioned earlier. They're, they're not going to get a certification. Attending this course doesn't help them get a certification. Oh, but they're attending the course. That, that's a good word. Let's just use attendance as what it means for someone to be in a course and for a, a trainer to tell us that, that, that someone showed up. Um, so this little sort of diamond in here we could sort of do um, initially. Then, we s then there's a very um, well tied together uh, between course type, which is kind of like a template, but it also holds some of the permission for what this course would be. Um, you can have a course that requires you to be a certified trainer to lead. You might have a course that only a certain organization has been authorized to teach because they submitted their you know, training materials and said, here, this is what I'm going to cover and how I'm going to cover it in this three-day course that I'm proposing. Um, so, there's, so they maintain uh, these approvals at various levels. And then we have um, a bunch of services that have to deal with what it means to be able to create courses. And those all now have a much better home in terms of the services. So when you look at a service like you know, course types approved trainer, well, that's something that has to deal with course types. And it needs to know a course type and a member, and it will set that member up as an approved trainer for that type of course. Um, when we when we do part two, I'll actually show code, and we'll I'll plan that out a little bit better. Um, when we in, when we got down into some of these other areas where we were replacing some of the earlier services already before we we're even live, we we realized either better naming convention or we now had more entities that we could deal with, and so we could. Um, do it a little closer to what it's really going to be. Um, so we ended up replacing some stuff. And at the same time, um, this is when we decided that, oh, some of our um, naming conventions needed to change. Uh, 
So we used to say, well, okay, course type acted sort of like a factory to build a course. And what we decided in, in, to further the goal of knowing, oh, if I want to do this, how do I find the code that implements that thing? You know, if I had this user story, where would I go to find the code? Because currently that can sometimes be um, a, you know, a game of hide and seek through the code. I wonder if it's here. No. Oh, but it includes this module. Is it in the module? No, it's not in that module. Maybe it's in. And that is something that we realized, oh, what comes out of this service is a course. You get a course entity when you're done. And the new is basically giving you the unsaved copy of an entity that, that could be put into a repo and then created and saved and it'd be persistent. So we said, well, that the, the namespace that a service goes into is based on the kind of entity or the kind of collection of entities that it's going to mainly be dealing with. So instead of course type having a new course service, courses has a new with service. And the reason it's not just a simple new is because there's some things that have to already exist. You have to have an existing course type and an existing organization in order to say there's a course that references those things. Um, so it's not just a standard um, where Rails calls things like REST services. We realize that the REST services doesn't mean a thing to a business person. Um, they want to be able to you know, manage courses or manage organizations or manage teams. So we started calling, oh, let's, let's just call the file that does the typical REST services, the typical CRUD behaviors, that's called manage. And these services are just a few lines long. We'll st just stick them all in there. But if it's not just a simple CRUD service, if it's not simply creating something new from whole cloth like you can for a course type, then it'll have a different name and it won't be part of that. It won't, we won't shove it into that same source file. So it gets its own source file. Um, we also have put the, the specs for those things um, separate. So even though we might say, oh, th you're just managing um, you know, an organization, it's got you know, your typical new, read, update, delete, uh, edit, um, what did I miss? Create, index, those normal actions, just throw those all in the manage. But the specs are all individual. So it becomes a lot easier to when you want to go and create some new functionality, I know that that's going to be a new, a new spec. I'm never going to go and try to add something to an existing spec. Um, good, a question. You mentioned services and repositories. What is the relationship Okay, the um, a repository is very simply that thing that can take an entity and save it, or give an identity of an entity, find the entity and hand it back to you. So, yeah. Repository is sort of like a wrapper on a database, right? That's its repository name. is is the closest thing that would be like the repository piece of Active Record is like the adapter itself. So the MySQL or the SQLite adapter that you would have that you would use with Active Record is the closest thing to being able to pull out. This is the sort of the repository pattern part of Active Record. Um, services are using repositories to um, either pers you know persist an, a new entity or find an existing entity either by giving its identity or giving some criteria to find it. So something that would be like a where clause um, that you'd use in Active Record. There's a criteria that you'd build, and, and we we're getting really close to actually putting some some helper, you know, syntactic sugar kind of thing, semantic sugar into repositories to do the really simple where I would just want equality to all these things, similar like you would do with a, an Active Record where uh, method. The um, the thing that I haven't talked about, um, which kind of helps, I, I mentioned services that need to deal with um, multiple entities. 
you need to do something with more than one kind of entity. Oh, I'm creating an organization, but I also want to create some teams. Or I have, uh, I have a course and I have a trainer that I'd like to add to the course. Do I, whoever I am, have the ability, you know, do I have the permission through my policy to take this course? Can, number one, can I add trainers at all? Oh, yeah, you can. Can you add this person as a trainer to this course? which may or may not be allowed depending on is this person allowed to be a trainer on this course at all? You know, could anybody have had this trainer or you, maybe I just, I can add trainers but I can't add this guy because he's not a trainer. Those decisions that happen within the service also get into another concept. Uh, an entity can also take two sort of specialized forms. A value object which is, like it sounds, if you've ever done a you know, value object in any other language, it's the same thing. Its equality is based on all of its, its attributes. You know, so I don't care how you got the number three, if it's a 3.0 float or it's a three, it's, a, it's three and they're equal because they're three, as opposed to entities which are equal based on their identity. I don't have to look at all their different uh, properties to figure out if an entity is equal because they should always be by their ID. There's also the notion of an aggregate, which is typically where um, you, would, you should only ever get a handle to an entity by asking some other entity, some aggregate for it. So for example, um, we don't ever expect that you deal with an assignment record, which is what ties a trainer to a course as a thing in and of itself. You don't go and ask an assignment repo for, oh, give me the assignment for this course and this trainer on this day. You can ask the course, can you tell me the trainers that you have? Or can you tell me the trainers that you have for this day? And then the service can take that record and do something with it, but it doesn't directly get it. Um, one of the things that we're uh, struggling with a bit because Active Record does this part really well and because of that it's really hard to try to use it without just using Active Record all, all of it and just taking all of its faults uh, in terms of how it entangles things is that it deals with associations really well. Um, in particular the thing that is causing us a little bit of grief is how well it deals with being able to build up things in memory and automatically save the entire collections of its has many uh, associated objects and making sure all of those got their identity as assigned to them. One of the first things we ran into when we had members, a member can have many email addresses. Um, they've got one that's sort of their primary one, but they can, they can establish many email addresses associated with their account. From a um, domain-driven perspective, oh, and I've actually got a, uh, I can add a little bit of, <coughs> oh, I changed directories. No, what did I call it? Um, one of the things that we ran into uh, was, and we'd actually written this anecdote before we actually ran into the actual problem in code, which was great because we could go back to our own documentation to find out how we should do this, um, which, was, which was kind of freaky. Um, in Rails, if you wanted to have a, uh, you know, have a, a typical, oh, I've got a bunch of email addresses and one of them is my primary, a lot of times you just, well, I would just put a primary flag on my email addresses so I know which one is primary. But then you have to worry, well, I want to make sure that only one of those email addresses is marked as my primary. What does it mean if I have two, if I have two of those uh, both have their primary flag on? What does that mean now? Uh, if you think of it from the domain-driven perspective, you end up saying, okay, well, I might have many email addresses, but 
I know, I'm the member, I know which one is my primary email address, so let me point directly to that one. And I only have one pointer, so I never have to worry about having multiple primary email addresses. Um, one of the problems that we, the problem that we ran into, which is the problem that Active Record just really nicely solves if you said, you know, if you just set things up in memory and it just persists everything when you say save, is an email address belongs to member. So an email address has to have a member ID in order for it to be valid when it's saved. And I can't have a primary email address ID to find it later until that email address has persisted and gets an identity. So we had to end up saying, well, okay, we've got this, this sort of two-step commit problem that we have within member. When everything was running through a memory-based repo, which is just stuffing entities into a hash and handing them back when you ask for them, everything worked great because it was all, you just, oh, we updated the ID there, everything's fine. But when you had to now say, well, I, I can't actually put this in the database until I have a member ID, um, that means I have to save the member record first. Then I can put the member ID on my email addresses and persist those. Now those have identities, and the one that I had identified as my primary, I can now take that identity and stick it into my primary email address ID in member. So we've had to introduce our own little hackish way of having a, an after save callback, um, which luckily it's Ruby, so we can just throw an instance variable on the object, and then after we've saved it, we can look at that and say, hey, does this instance variable exist? Oh, it does, and it just so happens that it's a, it's a lambda, so we can just call that thing and it'll do the right stuff. Um, so that's, that's the other side of uh, not using Active Record directly and then running into the things that Active Record sort of hides the complexity really nicely from you. Um, one of the things that when we were looking at how uh, Jim Wyrick was approaching this same idea uh, almost a year ago now, back in October, um, and one of the things that he was doing was, was actually re using um, uh, a delegate and wrapping an active record object with the entity object. And we started going down that road. It got a little bit complex at a time, but I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to go back to that because it solves nicely some of the problems by letting active record actually do the associations instead of trying to map back and forth from the record, which is the active record domain entity or domain object and the model thing, the entity. So we've got records which come from active record and entities which come from repositories. So the repository is doing this mapping of attributes back and forth. And we could avoid that if we actually just let the attributes stay where they are and put a little bit of a layer around the active record model. Um, the one thing that we have to do and be careful to do in that case is not basically treat all the low level active record methods, which are actually more the repository pattern methods, make those be effectively private from the entity's perspective. Repositories should know how to save things and load things. Entities themselves should not know how to save or load. They need to be given to an entity and say, here, please save me. Um, and the, there's been a couple other things that have sort of led us in those same directions. Um, along the way, whoops. Um, we've, and I can actually probably put this somewhere that you could get to. Um, there was a bunch of stuff that we were looking at in terms of, yes, the books I've mentioned, Domain Driven Design, um, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture, which if you're interested in knowing well, what actually is the active record pattern, that book would be where you would go to find out.
books there. It's kind of a, it's a more pragmatic and updated version of Eric Evans' book. Oh, okay. Yeah, we we've heard, talked about that. I don't think I don't think that that got in here anywhere yet. Um, it, but yeah. It's actually post rails, so it you know talks about about the same issues. Yeah. So, it's, it's good so yeah, there there's a bunch of things, some of which are useful, some of which um, are worth a little more than hot air. Um, some things are interesting, but maybe not quite applicable. Um, this was kind of an interesting paper, um, but it really didn't apply when we were planning on doing a more of a rewrite. We weren't trying to do a strangler vine kind of how do you start doing DDD stuff within the context of a big legacy system. Um, as far as I know, this is still a draft. There's a guy, Adam Hawkins, who also tweets out, and you can see the draft of his architecture paper. He's got a lot of good ideas and a lot of very uh, DDD compatible ideas. Uh, there's various blogs that talk about doing DDD. Um, uh, Von Vernon is sort of like the, the other torchbearer for domain-driven design be behind Eric Evans. Yeah. Um, uh, there's actually an online enterprise patterns list. This like will tell you what the patterns are very briefly, but if you want to read the details, you, you go to the book. This, this doesn't replace the book. This is sort of the companion to the book. Um, a bunch of things that we, uh, you know, run into. There's um, somewhere along the way, did I not copy the presentation? There's a presentation that Uncle Bob did um, at the 2011 Mountain West Ruby, I think it was, called um, the L Rails Architecture, the Lost, Lost Architecture, or something like that. I can't remember exactly the title. Architecture of the Lost Years. Architecture of the Lost Years, um, which is good. It talks about a lot of the same ideas, the idea of taking your application and making it an application, business-centered application first, and making it happen to be a particular framework's application second. It's not a Rails application. It's the Scrum Alliance business application, which is implemented within the framework of Rails. Um, the um, Uh, oh, here it is. Un architecture of the Lost Years. I don't know why I have it under miscellaneous and not like presentations. Um, but there's um, some of the things that we are using. Um, Virtus is... I, I, I'm not entirely convinced that it's going to stay. Um, if anyone's ever used Data Mapper, Data Mapper and Active Record sort of exist at two different points along the spectrum of uh, I have to define everything in my source language and Active Record's on the other end, which is I define nothing. I let the database do it. Um, and, it I, and the schema in the database tells me everything. Data Mapper, you, within, your, within your class, you specify here's my attributes. Um, Virtus gives is that part of it where you specify what the attributes are. Um, the problem is we end up having to sort of duplicate uh, attributes between our entities and uh, our our presenters, and it's in some ways our repository, so that we get our mapping right. Um, as as a gem. There's a lot of apparently little used complexity or the opportunity for complexity within Virtus that makes me think either it's trying to be too ambitious and design things too early or it was extracted from something a whole lot more complicated and they just ended up leaving some of that there because they needed it. They just don't explain why they have it the way they do. Um, uh, one of the things that's strange is that you include not 
a constant, but you include a something that is a method called on the Virtus object. And it builds the model that you want because you could also have given it a block or given it other options and the documentation with proper documentation that would explain how to use some of these features that are apparently lurking, it might seem better than I think it is right now. It's currently, uh, it's in like the good enough for now category. Um, one of the, a couple of things that we were um, finding, um, Interactor is essentially um, what we've called a service. Um, Interactor might actually be the term that Uncle Bob uses in his uh, description. He had a couple of very unique terms. Um, but that was essentially trying to do a, a similar kind of thing with service. Um, active interaction was another gen that I found that does essentially some combination of service and presenter. Um, I haven't talked about presenters, but those are essentially something that is a boundary between um, the framework view and your code. So the presenter is the, th the one thing that you'd say, here, here's what you need to present, and it sort of lets Form Builder deal with one single object. Um, so when you, like, uh, as an example, when you're creating, um, when you've said, oh, for this organization, I want to create a course, and you need to be able to present, here's the course types that this organization might be able to create, or that you might be able to create on behalf of this organization. The presenter would hold that that list that would be able to populate that select box. When you have a course and you want to add an approved trainer, the list of the potential trainers would be a collection within the presenter, um, so that your view you you try to keep logic out of your view by saying here you can put the logic into this presenter object and pass that object back and forth to a form. Um, Pundit was mentioned earlier. I think um, that is. Uh, what is being used to do policies, to do the authorizations for various uh, things within the system. The thing that is very nice about it is that it's you, you define a policy class that works for a particular entity. Um, and we're just now trying to figure out how we want to manage when I need not only to know who you are and what it is that you're operating on and the operation you'd like to do, but you'd like you, there's some object in that that permission sentence that you'd like to make. Um, we had we didn't run into those earlier because everything was a little simpler. Um, this um, access granted was a whitelist based authorizations. Um, the Scrum Alliance site early on had a very much whitelisted uh, permission system that was very much you know ad hoc. Um, and it's it's a bit of a pain. Um, we went we moved to CanCan -Can a few years ago on that, and that's much better. But it didn't completely eliminate um, the the strange whitelisting behavior. So there's CanCan -Can wants to deal with models uh, the way we are trying to deal with uh, the policy classes with Pundit. You know, here's here's a model. What can you do with this model? It's very model-centric or in the DDD terminology, entity-centric. Um, and uh, the old Scrum Alliance stuff is very, um, it has this sort of weird hybrid of uh, controller action-based whitelisting and model-based permissions. So that's, that's checking way too much. Um, the um, there's a couple. This is this Adam Hawkins is the guy that has this uh, architecture paper, which um, has it's still in draft. It's it's on GitHub. You can actually read it and and uh, make comments and essentially pull request things against it. And some well known people have uh, already given him a lot of pull requests and stuff. Um, I gave him a few. Uh, Abdi Grimm's got a whole bunch of pull requests against uh, his thing and comments against things. Um, and this is one of, he's, he tweets about a lot of stuff. And this, I think, was a tweet that might actually lead to a blog post also. Um, oh, maybe this is, uh, 
I think he has a blog post that talks about that too, or we found a blog post somewhere else. Um, so, uh, does anyone have a brain that can still think of a question? Oh, uh, Ryan. Yeah, yeah, a couple. Ryan um, wins. I mean, for one, I would say that, for what it's worth, the Rails 3, at least minor version, upgrades have been a much, much simpler undertaking than the 1 series and the 2 series. Um, <laughs> And, and so they have gotten better on that front. Uh, in, in case any of the you know people here who are newer with Rails are now horrified about having to go with Rails upgrades, it, it has gotten easier than it used to be. Um, the pre-bundler days were pretty ugly uh, when you tried to go from pre-bundler to uh, more modern era stuff. Um, and then you always had that directory in, in the initializers of a collection of monkey patches to fix things that were just broken. And, yeah. Anyway. Um, the question I have is, so, so Scrum Alliance is a client of yours, mm -hmm. and I don't know how large the team is, but is there a concern that while the stuff that you're doing is very interesting, and I think most fairly senior developers could get their head around it, when your time is, is up, for lack of a better word, with this client, do they have any concerns that they aren't really looking for a Rails developer so much anymore? And that they need to hire somebody who has, yes, they know Rails, but they really need somebody who is a architecturally strong Ruby developer. It, has that ever been a, a concern there? Uh, no, but they just recently hired their, they, they have two technical developers uh, on their staff now. One is a .NET person primarily and is managing the CMS. Uh, application for the most part, and the other is a, a new junior Rails developer who's focused really on the new stuff, um, and he's uh, he's he's somewhat new to Rails, which in a way is a problem, but in a way is a blessing because he hasn't been corrupted by the dark side of Rails. Um, so. But he also brings a fresh perspective of it in terms of, okay, well, sh where, how should I be doing this? And that actually spurs a lot of discussion. Oh, well, we were thinking to do it this way. Or, well, if we did it this way, here's the problems that we might run into because of all these other things in Scrum Alliance that you're still you know, coming up to speed on because it, it takes a while to come up to speed on the business side of Scrum Alliance. It's not easy. I explain it to some of the Scrum Alliance staff people occasionally. Because uh, <laughs> th there's a funny thing about institutional memory. Um, I was just at their release planning meeting yesterday, and there's uh, 23, 24 Scrum Alliance people now, and there's like four that are contractors. And um, I was chatting with, with one, and she's like, you know, between the two of us, you know, we're, we two are contractors, and we've got a lot of the institutional memory because a l we've been associated with Scrum Alliance for longer than about three quarters of the people who are Scrum Alliance people. <laughs> so that's a, that's a little bit scary, but, you know. stuff that Jim was pushing towards, um, and there's a video of him um, doing rails, off the rails, so to speak. I forget exactly what the name of the video is here. Uh, Ruby Brigade from October 2013. Yeah. And, and coupling from orthogonal rails, I think you called yeah. it. Yeah. And, and in some respects, that seems too much, but also it's embracing more OO. And so your question is, should we avoid OO because it's complicated? And I think in those questions, the answer is, is our OO too complicated? Not should we avoid OO? Yeah, I, th I, I think you're. Or, you know, if, if, if we wanted to not do OO, if for those of you who were at the <coughs> CMG meeting, 
today, we got a blast from the past and saw some beautiful PHP code suite that was, uh, I could only take about 15 minutes of it and I'm like, I don't know what to say. Yeah. You know, this code is so far gone, I don't know how to even begin to recommend you what to do with this code. And that's, I mean, I, a lot of people write PHP really fast. Yeah. Look at me, I can bang this stuff right. out. And they still do, right? Right. Even though it's 2014, even though we should know better, we're still writing, people still write crappy code. I still write crappy code from time to time as well. But that, does, that doesn't mean that we don't pursue better OO. Yeah, I think better OO. And just give up the Even though we I joke about giving up the Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very, very valid point. And I think, especially with some of the stuff you're doing, taking what would have been complicated logic inside a model or inside a controller and sticking it into a separate service object that you know is purpose built for a task. Mm -hmm. I think that stuff all makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Where it's for me, it starts to get a little bit shaky is where you're taking some of the functionality that you have out of box with like active record and re-implementing it in sometimes hacky ways to use to use your own word from earlier. Mm -hmm. That's where, for me, it gets a little bit like, eh, do I really want to leave this with someone? It might make a lot of sense to me right now, but the next guy, when he gets into this and he says, well, what, what the hell is this? You know, how does this work? Um, those kinds of things, I think, is where it's a, it's a fine line that we have to walk when we're making some of these architectural decisions. Yeah, yeah one, of the, one of the biggest things that I want to have come out at the end of this is someone who knows Rails has a chance of figuring it out before they also have to learn Scrum Alliance's all their business rules. Um, there were a couple of developers that Scrum Alliance contracted that through um, a company that's based in the US, but they were in Pakistan. And the, the time difference was a problem, but also skill set was a problem. And the, uh, the notion that you can take someone who says that they are a Rails developer and drop them into a complicated application. So, you know, 70,000 lines of code in the current application, um, 56,000 if you just look at the LOC. There's a lot of stuff in there, and from the spaghetti diagram I showed you at the beginning, a lot of it doesn't get executed at all anymore. It's essentially all dead code, but it would take longer probably to rip it out safely <laughs> <laughs> because there are some threads that go in weird places, um, and we've run into that a bit. Um, as of right now, where we've done just a little bit of stuff, we have a whole lot more places to look for stuff, but it's a, hopefully a lot clearer where certain kinds of code would be expected to be found. So, yeah. oh, I can look, and, and trike is the sort of made up word for beginning of this library. The stuff that's sort of like common core stuff for a repository, for a service, for an entity, for a policy, that's, that's all the trike uh, library. So um, uh, why does that not show up as a separate line somewhere? I guess that would be under libraries. So that's the specs. Um, so trike the library stuff is this guy up here. So. Um, you can see a l there's, a, there's as one third ish of the code is uh, in the library. Um, and then another, you know, the specs are about equal to the library code right now. Um, Apparently. 
kind of sort of how you would have a garden path rails app. Would it maybe have been easier just to use data mapper, for example, use Sinatra, or I mean, take your pick, whatever the libraries that you want <coughs> to use were um, to construct this thing? Um, maybe. Um, I'm not sure if Sinatra would end up being a good choice because there's there's a lot going on behind the scenes and from when I've played with Sinatra it tends to not scale up gracefully just because of the way I remember it going together. Um, there's a lot of there's still quite a few moving parts I mean, when you look at all the this other sort of below the line stuff you know that um, you know, there's there's big bunches of things in here that um, you know aren't sort of the core, but you sort of need this stuff in support of the the core business. Um, so these are all things that users do or that enable users to do things. Like all this stuff here is just to make sure that users can get to that third-party site and get single sign-on over there to take their test. You know, so yeah, so a lot of this code will hopefully, a lot of this stuff down here we hope is going to be sort of transplanted from the diseased host into the new body. Um, and that will leave a lot of the other stuff behind that we don't even care about anymore. Um, so. Part of the answer to the question is yes, probably could have, but to avoid getting into the, some of the same problems that come from having tied the business solution really tightly to a particular framework or a particular version of a particular framework, whether that was thoughtful or accidental, and it tends to be more accidental or coincidental than really thoughtful, oh, I want to tie this to this version of Rails. And, and rather than, oh, I happen to use this feature that Rails decided should change, so now I have to go and change how I do something. And, and the, the fact that that actually does happen is part of what's uh, leading us to try to keep the business stuff separate from and not corrupted by the particulars of the particular framework, which happens to be Rails. You know, not that I ever expect it to become like an iPad app, but theoretically you could say, oh, well, just lop off the Rails bit and put some iOS stuff on here or Swift stuff or whatever it's going to be now. Um, and you could run this as an iPad app, right? Um, the Scrum Alliance application could be a big iPad app just by taking the framework specific bits that boundary that if you watch the uh, architecture of the lost years, you sort of see drawn terminology is a little different from Rails, but he references it enough that. So, a few minutes ago, made a comment. SUNY, right? I love your example because there's a whole bunch of log stuff now which is in there which are specifically there because one of the Pakistani developers put them in because he couldn't figure out the the way that logic flowed through four or five different classes and their subclasses as things were happening and um, it's it's not the best way when you have to actually run stuff in a production or production-like environment to figure out what's going on. 
Um, but it's also not, in some cases, possible to document things in a way that makes both business sense and technical sense the way things are put together now. There's definitely things, there are some things that are more easily described by the business. Here's how things should work that are much more complicated in terms of how that actually gets done inside the system. And there's a few places where the reverse is true. They have a very complicated way of trying to describe things. They want to write out scenarios on how, you know, if A and B and C and D, then E. And if F and G and H and I, then F. You know, sometimes those are easy, more easily solved in code. It's like, well, there's just a rule. <laughs> And you know they all all those things that you, all those scenarios you're describing. There's only two rules, and it's how they interact. You don't need, you know, you didn't need eight scenarios. Just to f just understand these three rules. You know, yes to no, yes to no, yes to no. Yeah, that's eight different things you have to talk about. But it's a lot easier to talk about the rules. And, and none of the business people are, all the business people are further away time zone wise from Pakistan than I am. Even though in Pakistan he was typically working like a 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, local time shift for him. But that meant by that he was done, he started at like, what was it, f 3 a.m., 4 a.m.? Because I know I surprised him a couple times by responding to him like right away because I was still up. <laughs> uh, but normally, uh, the, there was a bigger problem with the, the, the few hours of overlap that he would have with the business people that were trying to do acceptance test work on, on the things that were done fundamentally or primarily by uh, one of the two programmers in Pakistan. So part of it, part of that problem of documentation is, and this goes back to the very beginning when I was writing C code, uh, and the 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 anecdote was the compiler doesn't read comments. So it doesn't matter what the comment says. The comment's supposed to have been kept up to date with the code change. But the compiler didn't care what you put in that comment. It's the code that it's looking at. Same is true when you're looking at the application. 
you, you need to be able to see the code, and if you can make the code more intention revealing, then um, you shouldn't need to, be, to document what the code is doing. At best, you should have to document why you do something a certain way, but that's not always clear from the code what the business intent was. Um, the specs, as James said, is, is one way to try to get around that. So you can see, here's what the business meant. But it um, has never, it, it's rare that you can find clients that will actually be directly involved in writing the specs or validating the specs as written. So there, there's definitely some benefit in making things as clear as possible to someone who's not a programmer so that they can look at something that's actually an RSpec file and, and read it and have meaningful enough names about what is going on there that they might have a chance of saying, whoa, no, this can't be right. You know, if, if you mean what I think you mean here, that's, not, that's definitely wrong versus, yeah, I think that's okay. There's, there's a, a, a very lofty goal of having clients who can at least read and validate the specs that you'd like to say are the description of your system, but that doesn't happen nearly as often as anyone in this room would probably like, I'm sure. Um, it's, um, it's particularly hard to do that now with Scrum Alliance because they've added, they've probably added 10 people this year um, in some, a little heavy in member support, but also because they're getting bigger, they're adding some more support people and you know there's a new person who's in charge of operations and day-to-day -day stuff and so they've they've been adding people at a rate that means they internally are explaining how things work to the people that deal with the membership or deal with trainers or deal with people uh, you know look, having questions about how they should approach certifications or what happens with this problem or you know, why did this happen on my account, or why can't I do this that I used to be able to do? Um, and, and hopefully they can keep up with that enough that uh, development can continue on the new stuff to dig out of the hole that they're in from a version perspective. And, and essentially, I mean, the bottom line is the, both the Ruby version and the Rails version that they're on are completely unsupported effectively completely unsupported. There's a tiny little lifeline out for Ruby 187, but other than that. Um, so if, some, if something is discovered that is broken in a bad way, no one's going to fix it except us. <laughs> so we hope it doesn't break. I was very interested when the, when the Rails 4041 vulnerability was described, uh, I think, Sunday. Um, to see what is it? Oh, okay. It's something that didn't exist until Rails 4, therefore it, it's not a problem with our system. But, but that's, that's always a concern. I mean, I know very early on, in the very, very early days of Rails, uh, when we were still at CART meetings, and there was a, a security problem that was, th that the very well-known people, Dave Thomas, some people were saying, Upgrade your Rails sites. If you have a Rails site in production, upgrade it. And people were like, why? <laughs> Trust us. <laughs> upgrade your site. When, we, when people have had some time to get their sites upgraded, then we'll let you know. And at the time, one of the Rails core committers was in Cincinnati, was at our meetings, and told us what the vulnerability was. It was Rails takes your schema and puts it into a, a Ruby DSL, basically, your schema RB file. And the way that it, the way the routing worked, it would try to find a file and it would look in the, if you typed in, you know, site name slash config slash schema dot RB, it would say, oh, I can find that. It's Ruby code. I can execute that. I can wipe your database out. 
and it didn't require any special knowledge or permission or anything. And all it took was someone saying, hey, I wonder if this is a Rails site slash config slash schema.rb. Yep. It was a Rails site. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I mean, when, when, you, when you hear certain things, so there's been some vulnerabilities that have come out. Um, and, and hardly to a certain extent recently where people, when, when people who know tell you in all seriousness, hey, hey you stop what you're doing and upgrade your site. And you're like, okay, I'm going to start upgrading the site. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll figure out why later. Um, Yeah. So yeah, there's there's definitely um, hard issues. This you know ma mismatching your rate of change with your framework v of e your business is not the worst thing, but it can get pretty bad if left unchecked. And there's there probably is not any. Com more comprehensive place to define how the system works than, unfortunately, the code itself. You know, there's there's a lot of, well, hey, sh w shouldn't you be able to do this? And um, one of the things that I found is very difficult for, and this is true with Scrum Alliance people, as other clients have been in the past. It's very difficult for them to suspend their knowledge of how the system works now and talk about how the system, how they said they want the system to work tomorrow. And if you start talking about how the system works tomorrow and tell them implications, they're like, but, 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 no, no, no. I know it doesn't do that today, but you said you wanted it to do this tomorrow, right? Yeah. So this is how that would work. But, but, Right? If, if A, B, C, then D, right? Yeah, but we can't do B today. I know. But if you can do B, then you can do C and D, right? Yeah, I think so. Let me think about that. And it's, and it's sometimes very hard. I, it's not the first time I've had client. I mean, I don't think I've had a client that's not had that particular problem to a certain degree. Programmers tend to be a lot better at imagining how something will work and sort of holding that that model of how something's going to work in their head and thinking through the implications of it. Um, Data visualization? <laughs> Conceptualizing code. So, there we go. If it's only an hour and a half. We could do we could listen to it. <laughs> okay. So your homework is well is does this do 2x? No, I don't think so. I hate when you can't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The CMS is um, was actually so Scrum Alliance interviewed four different companies. They were looking for a Denver local company to basically do their marketing, the graphic design for a new site, and offer their their uh, you know sort of total package solution for these particular aspects of Scrum Alliance's site. Um, of of the four, um, I'm happy to say that the one that I put first among the four is the one that they went with. I didn't have a whole lot of variation in my things because okay, well if they if they can do it, then fine. Um, it's called Kentico CMS, 
It's a .NET based um, system. And the person they ended up hiring, um, so a year, a little more than a year ago, I was starting to help them look for a .NET person and fearing that I might actually have to learn some .NET stuff to be able to work with whoever they found. And stumbled across somebody who applied, who was working for a company that's down near Kenwood, who worked for this design, this marketing firm for like three years, had been the one that brought Kentico into their group to replace whatever ASP.NET or some crap they were doing before that. Sorry if anyone's doing ASP.NET, but don't. Um, and so it's like, oh, I, I, you know, you could not have taken the job description and fabricated a resume that looked very much better than, than what his did. Um, and, and I interviewed like seven different people sort of from a technical perspective as much as I could. And he, I sort of tied him with uh, somebody else and like, well, he's local. I'm going to put him first because I have to put them in some sort of order in the email. I'm not going to put them on one line. And, and it worked out and he's worked out great. So um, it really scared me when I went to the local .NET users group and there's 20 some people or whatever in the room and none of them had heard of Kentico. And that, that was the first time I was maybe getting a little concerned that, oh, is, does, no one, does no one use this thing? It's on like version six or seven. I mean, it's, someone's got to use this, right? Um, I think it originally came out of like the Czech Republic or something like that. I think that's still where their main developers live or something like that. Um, but it works well. It does what a CMS should do. For the most part, um, you don't have to pay attention to the fact that it happens to be running on a Windows machine and written in .NET and all that good stuff. Um, and a lot of the content generation that used to have to either be put into source code because it was in a view somewhere um, or uh, was in sort of the article model that the system had, um, that's some of the stuff that went away. And they've got, you know, and it's got a whole publishing workflow. All the all the bells and whistles that you'd hope that a CMS has, they have. Um, they've run into some weird stuff because the company that did it um, changed some of the, like, monkey patched some of the internal core stuff of Kentico in making some of the stuff for Scrum Alliance work. And, and I asked Aaron how often, I mean, how hard it is to upgrade when you've done that. And he's like, I don't know, in three years I've never had to do something like that. <laughs> so this, the, the company that did that work is just barely involved and is not really involved in the website stuff at all anymore. Um, they're still using them for some of the, the marketing stuff and some of the graphic design stuff. Um, but uh, as, as a CMS, it's working fine. It's got some APIs that, that uh, Rails is the server for that um, will send back course information, user information, user group information, uh, so that those can, things can be done. Um, but just, I, I think it's just, just topical. I mean, it's where, you know, where the companies that are using it are. Um, certainly, if anyone who was from um, Gyro was down there, they'd be like, oh, yeah, I use it. Cause <laughs> they'd been using it for a couple of years. So. Actually, at one point, um, a couple of years ago, we were looking at CMS, a Ruby-based CMS. And there was a couple of possible examples, but none of them were very mature. Um, and a lot of them were sort of like, here's, here's a framework that will help you roll your own CMS, which is not what they were looking for at all. Um, but it was certainly a, you know, yeah, it would be at, it would certainly be better if only you took all of these really common things and said, here, let, let something else do this stuff that's really common that Rails is not really bringing any value to. And in particular, Scrum Alliance doesn't actually bring any value to. I mean, 
those things bring value to Scrum Alliance because it lets them get content out faster and organize things a little bit better. Um, but uh, for example, they so Kentico has another module called EMS, Enterprise Marketing System or Solution or something like that. And um, it sounds really good feature-wise. Scrum Alliance was starting to use it. Um, Turns out Scrum Alliance, with its 300,000 members, um, was going to be by far the biggest user of the EMS module to date. And they were running into some performance problems. So they said, well, let's look at some other things to handle some of the email marketing that they wanted to do. And so now they're using Marketo and have been for about two months, I think, now. Um, it does everything that they want to do because guess what? Marketo is designed to be an email marketing platform. <laughs> and you know, when when we ask them about scale and they're like, you know, well, Oracle uses us and they send out like 10 million emails a month. You know, okay, you can handle 300,000, not a problem. <laughs> 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 so, it it's really interesting when when different kinds of companies talk about what they mean by large scale and you know to you know to a rails application having you know 300,000 records in a database so it was large scale i had a client that had like 10 million rows in in one of their tables and that was really large scale and you know certain things would just take a long time and then you you know talk to other kinds of applications other kinds of it's like oh yeah well you know if you get if you get a, you know more than a million, oh, okay, no, never mind. You can take all the records in all the tables that Scrum Alliance has, and they still probably only barely get above low single digit millions, <laughs> and and some of those just go away. And it's almost eight thirty. Yeah, when people have some time, a month or two, to sort of digest this and think about it when you're doing your own Rails codes, oh, this, am, I, am I conflating my business solution code with code that really is strictly framework code? You know, you'll have some of those little, little voices in the back of your head saying, I wonder, if, I wonder if I'm a couple years away from making this a big problem later. When <laughs> so when, when you've had some time for that to sort of, you know, you know ferment a little bit in the back of your head, uh, you'll be ready to look at some of the code. And, and we'll be a little further along in, in getting some of the other meteor parts put together to see if we run into, you know, walls that we think would rather be avoided than scaled. Um, This this is a rewrite. It's a it's a transplant of the good parts into a new Rails 4.1 Ruby 2.1 based application. Yeah. So yeah, we in there's Scrum Alliance website, which is their current stuff, and there's Scrum Alliance core, which is because well the whole the website's now split between Kentico and Rails. So it's not the whole website, but it's the it's the membership and certification and course core of Scrum Alliance, and that was Rails new. And that's being like extracted over time and but actually used. Like the new code is in production and the old code is in new production. code is not yet. The, none of this is actually in production yet. Okay. So it's just experimental until it's complete enough to cut over. It's in development. I wouldn't say it's experimental. Okay. <laughs> It's not live on the site. It it is it's the the project is called supported stack. The vernacular is it's the Rails rewrite, but to sell it to the board, it's supported stack. Here's you know the the exposure is probably not getting any worse. 
but no one can say that there's not a vulnerability that is going to reach way back into uh, code base and say, oh yeah, this might be a big problem. Yeah. And, and there's been some of those that just happen not to have affected the code as written. Well, with that much code, there's definitely a problem. It just hasn't been found yet. Right. right. <coughs> yeah. Well, and that's why so, so many. Mm, there are, so this um, only got attention as sort of a, an actual project that was officially supposed to be worked on um, in May. But the, but going back to at least um, last October uh, is when I was saying, hey, none of this is supported anymore. Oh, actually, it's before that, because the first time I brought it up, we were a, it was a month away from the end of June last year that Ruby 187 first hit its first end of life. Um, it's, it's either just hit or is about to hit its like third end of life. And if somebody else doesn't resuscitate it again, <laughs> it's, it's just really dead. Um, it's yes, very much like that. Um, so there's uh, there's been lower levels of thought about it, and certainly there are diff there are definitely parts of of this lower level stuff that were done, and all of this organization team membership um, trainer approval stuff. This is actually a di these three models actually have different names than they have in the system today. Because these make more sense talking about them than the names the database tables and the, and the models have today. Um, but so th there's been an expectation that we need to be able to upgrade things or rewrite things and move things over for over a year, more like a year and a half probably. Um, and it's been a a known issue for probably two and a half years. It was it was practically an issue before Gaslight even had Scrum Alliance. So it's been a but time doesn't help. A long project and a lot of thought went into how to do things and stuff, but it isn't like you have to figure out how to safely refactor this thing inside the other application without breaking the whole thing. Um, kind of a stack, right? No. Yeah. One of one of the problems that the current system, as it stands, has, is that where the new system has a nicely factored, well named member entity that represents everyone. A. a In the current system, there is a user model and a profile model. And the best that I can describe how these two models interact is that they were conjoined twins at some point, And there was a just barely successful operation to separate them. And some of the parts got left in the wrong twin. Um, there's, there are Places where it goes from the user record through the profile record to get to the email addresses. The user record, which is where the login name lives and where the password hash, uh, encrypted hash is kept. But the, the field that keeps track of when they did a last login is on profile. So there's hardly anything that you can do without getting both the user and the profile record. The profile record has got all the the big fields like your the, the bio and the the you know the text fields um, from just a database perspective. One of the things that uh, I'm very keen to do because I ran into this on previous clients too, and I've actually got archived some old but still very relevant um, descriptions or presentations from someone who was a the MySQL community evangelist or something was his title actually about doing horizontal partitioning from a database optimization perspective 
if you have these big records, it's going to make your database performance really suck because you can't cache those records very well. If you only need this much stuff, then have a table that only has a record with this much stuff, and you'll be able to put lots of them into a block when it's cached. You throw a text field in there, and basically you've blown your ability to cache things because the optimization is based on how big that record could be, not how big that the records actually are. So oh, throw a text field in there that I think in the, the default text field that Active Record creates in a modern MySQL is the two gigabyte version of the text field. So I know at one point it was the 16 megabyte version of the text field because the Pakistan guys had a different version of MySQL in his development environment that I had in mind and there was a big war going on. Every time somebody did a migration, all this stuff looked like it changed because it tried to change the text fields from two gig fields to 16 megabyte fields. Um, so keeping those separate where you don't need to reference them all the time. You, any record you want to reference all the time and update all the time, you want to be as small as you possibly can make it. So a member is intended to be small like that. Um, and eager loading as little as possible um, is certainly a, a design goal and not having to always bring in three records whenever you really would only like to get one. Anything else? All right. Good stuff, Rob. Next time we'll look at code.